Don, I, like you, have been thinking about consciousness. And to begin with, we say, well, where did consciousness come from? Obviously, it came from an evolutionary process. And so there's a whole uh, subculture of people talking about the evolutionary psychology of all different kinds of traits, including consciousness. Yes. Uh, how, how does this work? Well, as far as perception and evolution goes mm -hmm. uh, and consciousness, the standard view in the field is that um, natural selection has shaped us to have conscious experiences that truly reflect the state of the world that our perceptions are, as they say, veridical, true to the state of the world. And the argument is quite simple. Uh, those of our ancestors that uh, didn't see truly were at a disadvantage in the competition with those of our ancestors who did see truly. And as a result, they uh, were less likely to have kids, less likely to survive long enough to have kids. So we're the offspring of those who saw truly, and therefore, on evolutionary grounds, we can expect that our, our senses are, in general, Reliable, not perfectly. Because if your senses are attuned to the world, goes the theory, that you are more likely to eat lunch than be lunch. That, that's right. <laughs> you're, you're more likely to, to avoid that tiger and to catch prey yourself because you're seeing the truth. Mm -hmm. And you're more likely to uh, you know, avoid the cliffs and, yeah. and the snakes and so forth. Right. So, so if you see truly, um, you will have greater fitness than those who, who don't see truly, and you'll have more kids, and so your genes for seeing truly will get passed on mm -hmm. and, and, to your kids. And get amplified over generations. Absolutely. The idea would be that they spread throughout so that very few of us um, will have perceptions that are, are marginally, you know, that are false. Okay. Uh, so um, maybe a few you know, people with psychological problems might have you know, perceptions that are odd and schizophrenia or something like that, but that's, that's a rarity. Mm -hmm. Most of us can trust our perceptions. Uh, so that's the, the standard view, and I think that uh, it utterly, it's utterly false. It, it mistakes some of the key points of evolutionary theory. Evolution, so now that's a radical claim. I mean, right. what you're saying now is, is critiquing what is not only the standard theory, but it, it seems like a very intuitive theory. That's that right. that almost sounds uh, obviously correct, and you're right. saying it is actually wrong. That's right. It, it, it seems obviously correct, and it's actually in the textbooks, in the standard, for example, vision science textbooks, the argument is given that evolution guarantees that our perceptions are generally true. Okay, so the burden is on you. It certainly is. Uh, to explain to me and everyone else why you have such a dramatic challenge to the accepted conventional wisdom. Uh, so first I'll give an intuition, then I'll give a little bit of more, more hard reasons why. The, the first intuition is that Evolution is about fitness in the first place. So, and fitness and truth are very, very distinct notions. Fitness depends not only on the state of the world, but also on the organism and the state of the organism. So, for example, um, a steak could have high fitness value for a hungry lion that wants to eat. This can have much lower fitness value for that lion if it's full and it wants to mate. And a steak probably has no fitness value to a cow in any state. <laughs> so the, the notion of what is the fitness of a particular aspect of the world is relative to the organism and its state. So it's not about truth, it's about fitness that evolution is concerned with. So then the question that I addressed in my lab with my, my graduate students, Justin Mark and Brian Marion and others, was <clears throat> let's run what are called evolutionary games. So the, Darwin's theory has been made mathematically precise in evolutionary game theory. We can create any worlds we want to in the computer, and we can create organisms in those worlds with perceptual systems tailored the way we want. Some that see all of the truth, some that see part of the truth, some that see no truth, but they're only tuned to the fitness functions in that world. And we run these evolutionary simulations. And what we find is that truth goes extinct almost all the time. Truth goes extinct. Yes. Extinct. That, that's right. That's, so, that's a remarkable word to talk about truth, about, uh, about what's really out there in the world. It, 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 it really is. It was, it, it's a bit of a surprising result. We found that the only time that truth has any chance of survival is if fitness functions involved are, in some sense, almost the same as the structure of the world. 
So for example, if you have a, a resource like water, and, and the resource can have a very little amount of water all the way up to a very big amount of water. And so that's a linear order, they call it, of, of the amount of water. And if the fitness of the water for the organism is dependent, you know, is, is very little for a small amount of water and very large for a large amount of water, so it's what we call monotonic, then truth has a chance to survive. But any other function, and it, and it doesn't have a chance, any non-monotonic function, and, it, and the truth organisms in our simulations will go extinct. And we've done this with evolutionary game theory. I should mention we've also done it with genetic algorithms. So we try to actually um, get populations of organisms with genes that we randomly mutate and have them you know, breed and reproduce. And, and we can't even get truth to, to breed. So, so truth never even rises to the point where it can actually compete. So a critical assumption here is that what is required for fitness for a given species is different in some ways than the way the world is really structured. That's a, a critical assumption that you make in order for the result to occur that evolution drives truth being a, 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 your, rea your perception being of reality to extinction. That, you, need, you need that assumption. That's right. Now that, so the, and I agree with you. So the assumption, the, the condition is that if fitness is not essentially the same thing as truth, then truth will go extinct. But mathematically, it's almost always the case that fitness is distinct from the structure of truth, that they're not isomorphic or, or homomorphic. Some specific examples in the real world as far as uh, human fitness is concerned. So, yeah, for, so for example, in the case of uh, the water example, a little wa if you have too little water, you die of thirst. Too much, you, you can drown. drown. Sure. You have you know, a, couple, a couple glasses of water is just right. So here's a fitness function that is, uh, penalizes you for too little, rewards you for just the right amount, and then penalizes you for too much. Salt. Too little, you die. Too much, you die just the right amount. So this is, homeostasis is ubiquitous in human life. And it's about homeostasis, you know, we try to maintain homeostasis, which means not too little, not too much. And so it means that in general, fitness is a non-monotonic function of the structures in the world. So what we did was we, in the computer, can simulate hundreds of thousands of different worlds with different numbers of territories and resources, different fitness functions. So we do what are called Monte Carlo simulations. We run millions of trials. We can create organisms that can see all the truth in those worlds, part of the truth, none of the truth, that are tuned to fitness or not. And so we run you know, many hundreds of hours of simulations, millions of trials, and we can and then... for each organism, artificial organism that you have, how many fitness functions would you have uh, that you would compare fitness functions with reality? Oh, we would try several different fitness functions. So we could try, we'll try monotonic fitness functions, Often Gaussian fitness functions are, are reasonable fitness functions. So we would we will throw in two or three like different fitness functions like that okay. to, to try and it run out. millions of trials. Millions of trials. That's okay. right. All right. And and we'll tr we'll have different strategies compete against each other. Um, and what what we find is that um, natural selection drives true perceptions to swift extinction. Now that's and, just a startling it, statement. It's it's absolutely startling. And it has strong implications. It means that our... What does our, it mean for us? What does it mean in terms of our perceptions of the world? We can't trust it. We can trust it to survive but, and, and mate and eat. Uh, but in terms of understanding the world, what does it mean? Yeah, it, it means that our perceptions are a great guide to keep us alive. They're very, very useful. They, they're for fitness. But if we think that they're giving us an insight into the ultimate nature of objective reality, they're not. So the jewel beetle is an interesting example of this. Uh, it's, it's this beetle in the outback of Australia. The males uh, are brown, glossy, and have bumpy wing cases. The males are, you know, can fly, the females are flightless. The males fly along looking for females, and when they find uh, an available female, they alight and mate. Another species out in the Australian outback, the Homo sapiens, the male of that species, <laughs> uh, likes full beer bottle, bottles, doesn't like empties, and tosses the empties out into the desert. It turns out the bottles are bumpy, glossy, and just the right shade of brown. <laughs> to tickle the fancy of these male jewel beetles, they swarm the bottles, they forsake the females, and the species almost went extinct. Wow. The, um, the government of Australia had to actually pass laws to save the, the species. And what this shows, here's a beetle, uh, a species, that had 
survived for hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions of years, quite well. The males had found the females and mated. Sounds like their perceptions were true indicators of what the females were. Not at all. Apparently, they had a little trick, something that's bumpy and glossy and brown, <laughs> You know, find it and made it. The bigger, the better. <laughs> so uh, throw a beer bottle out there. The whole thing came crashing down. The species could have gone extinct. Wow. And that's what evolution does for us. It gives us perceptual systems that are not there to tell us the truth. They're tricks and hacks that let you survive long enough to reproduce.